Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with all of you today, and thanks for joining us. Welcome to Pattern for Progress's monthly housing webinar series. Our monthly webinar series has been graciously and generously sponsored by NeighborWorks America. This month's webinar is the third and final session dedicated to sustainable development and demand for low carbon buildings. Pattern is pleased to be partnering with our longtime supporter, the Community Preservation Corporation on this virtual series. Before we get too far, I wanna take a moment to remind everyone that our annual housing forum is scheduled for October 26th, 27th, and 28th next month. We've got three virtual sessions, all of them starting at 9 a.m. on each of those days. The forum is entitled, <clears throat> A Housing Crisis, No Place to Call Home. We're, dedicated our we're dedicating our entire forum to potential solutions to address the lack of housing inventory within all levels of the market. Simply speaking, affordable workforce and market rate. We have nationally recognized keynote speakers and panelists addressing the shortages ranging from single family homes to small rental complexes to multifamily developments. Please go to our website and register today. So today's topic is financing high performance. We have a very busy morning, so I wanna quickly frame this conversation. As I indicated last month, oftentimes affordable housing developers pave the way for others to follow in terms of new design and implementation of energy saving, building techniques and materials. Thanks to community-based organizations and community-minded developers, the Hudson Valley has a host of incredible award-winning developments that we highlighted last month. The question that many people ask, how do these projects actually get funded? We're going to hear all about financing these developments this morning. The Community Preservation Corporation has been an industry leader with their lending products for multifamily housing, which includes design systems and major elements of high performance construction. Developers typically layer a number of federal, state and local resources together to essentially create what is called a capital stack. This is also known as lasagna financing to make these deals viable. These resources may include low-income housing tax credits, historic tax credits, grants, equity, and debt. Some of the incentives may include resources through NYSERDA. The traditional financing resources for housing from New York State now come with requirements for reducing energy costs. Saving energy and reducing the carbon footprint is a necessity and must be viewed as a new as the new paradigm in development. The lower the costs for the owner and tenant, the more affordable the units are for the residents. This morning, you will hear from professionals in multifamily finance and development. Before introducing the panel, just a little bit of housekeeping. Please use the Q&A box to post questions and we'll do our best to fit them in at the end of the panel discussion. So let's get started and I'd like to introduce our speakers. Now to maximize our time together and have the, uh, the, the, the best and robust you know, Q&A session, I'll introduce each speaker. They're gonna give their presentation and then we'll have the Q&A at the end. We have four incredible speakers today and their bios may be found on our website. So joining us today, from the Community Preservation Corporation is Italia Howe, Manager in Sustainability Programs, and Danielle Donnelly, Sustainability Associate. We'll also be hearing from two housing developers that have incorporated high performance building design, materials, and techniques into their properties. Bill Balter, President of Wilder Balter Partners and its construction affiliate Griffin Associates, and Susan McCann, Regional Senior Vice President of Real Estate Development in the at, with, the, uh, with the community builders. So let's kick off this session with Italia and Danielle. Thank you again, and we're gonna hold off these questions until the end. Good morning, Italia. Good morning. So I think Danielle's gonna pull up the presentation. There we go. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, firstly, just wanna thank uh, Pattern for Progress and specifically Joe and Michelle 
um, for hosting this important webinar series dedicated to sustainable development and low carbon design uh, and, and for inviting CPC to, to participate. So I think we can go to the next slide. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with CPC, we are a nonprofit affordable housing uh, and community revitalization finance company. We were founded in 1974 in New York City to address the urban blight that had become very common in, in the city and in, in many cities throughout the United States. Uh, CPC provides construction and permanent financing to owners of multifamily housing in low and moderate income neighborhoods in New York City and throughout New York State. We are, uh, over our multi-year history, we have grown to become the largest community development financial institution in the country solely dedicated to multifamily housing. Um, so just looking at some of kind of our, our key metrics that we're very proud of, um, again, you know, throughout our history, we've invested over uh, $12 billion to date, uh, contributing to the preservation or creation of over 220,000 units of quality housing for low income families and senior citizens. Uh, we've initiated numerous downtown revitalizations um, and we've improved the quality and energy efficiency of the multifamily uh, building stock. Next slide. So our sustainability uh, platform was uh, created in 2008 really to carry out the organization's sustainability and decarbonization initiatives. Uh, the platform's mission is to promote energy uh, conservation and water conservation measures as a means of improving, improving the financial quality and physical quality of the buildings and communities in which we live and work. Uh, the cost savings associated with energy efficient measures plays a key role in ensuring the long-term economic stability of multifamily properties, which is really critical to the preservation of rental affordability in our communities, which as we all know is, is, a, is a major uh, crisis that we're all facing. Um, and so since 2013, we have financed over 8,000 units of energy efficient, affordable housing. A key focus of our platform is education and industry support. So we work very closely with our partners in multifamily finance and sustainability, uh, both at the state level and the city level to promote lending practices that really support new technologies and high performance design standards. And that's kind of the key of our presentation today is to walk you through some of those, those resources that we've created. Uh, and we you know, look to lead by example, that's the best way to lead. Uh, and so CPC committed to achieving carbon neutral operations uh, in, in approximately 2019. We, we achieved that in 2020 and we continue uh, to achieve carbon neutral operations. So we measure our carbon footprint on an annual basis. Uh, we have a robust uh, carbon reduction strategy internally. Um, and then we offset any residual emissions um, with high quality uh, third party approved uh, carbon offset projects. So Danielle, I'll pass it over to you to talk about our underwriting efficiency guide. Thanks, Natalia. Um, so one of the first resources that was created under the sustainability platform was the underwriting efficiency handbook. Uh, it was created in 2017 and published to provide lenders with a framework for incorporating energy efficiency and water conservation measures uh, and the savings associated with those measures into the financing of first mortgages. Uh, it was designed to work in tandem with the New York City Housing Preservation and Development Agency's Green Overlay. So the agency has adopted Enterprise Green Communities as their standard, and that standard uh, mandates a 30% uh, reduction in energy usage and water usage. So uh, CPC, as a close partner of HPD, folded that into uh, the handbook and, and the way we were going to underwrite those savings. Uh, and it started to shift the conversation around energy efficiency in housing and in retrofits and the way that integrates into how we finance buildings. Um, so it was created mostly as a way for CPC to communicate internally with our own uh, mortgage officers um, to share best practices. And then again, across the industry with our partners and other uh, affiliate organizations. Um, and came up with one approach to incorporating the cost savings from energy efficiency and water conservation uh, into mortgage underwriting. Um, so you can see here in a typical mortgage, you, you've got your standard operations, which would be your utilities and other costs. The, and um, when we see greater reduction in utilities through energy efficiency and water conservation, so saving money on electricity or gas for heating, um, and, and water, you 
you wind up with a greater net operating income by incorporating those savings. Um, along with the, the tangible cost benefits of incorporating energy efficiency into the mortgage, we, we also see intangible benefits in underwriting savings and incorporating energy efficiency. Uh, the first being financial stability. The performance of the building means that uh, greater net operating income means more cash flow for the building to continue to operate and maintain uh, operations. Um, we're mitigating risk here. So uh, more efficient systems means better operations for the building, potentially less maintenance on the building uh, and the ability to um, be resilient against some of the, the effects of climate change that we might be seeing right now. And then the potential increased value of the building. When you have better, more efficient, newer systems, um, the value of the building is increased. Another intangible benefit that we're particularly focused on is tenant satisfaction. We are creating this housing for the people who live in it, and we want them to have you know, clean, safe, healthy, comfortable places to live uh, for the long haul, and ensuring that um, folks can, can live in a comfortable space that is well ventilated uh, and comfortable uh, with the added benefit of a reduced energy burden and energy cost burden on low-income tenants. That's, that's what we focus on a lot. And then property condition, the, the safety, quality, and maintenance and stewardship of these properties is only enhanced by including energy efficiency uh, in the scope of work. So after we published the Underwriting Efficiency Handbook, we started to see some of the challenges coming uh, up in the industry as we started to underwrite cost savings into the mortgages that we were financing. Um, one was that most lenders don't have specific products that promote or incent energy efficiency measures in buildings. Um, Fannie, and, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have expanded their green advantage programs, which includes preferential pricing for buildings that do complete um, green building certifications. But we've seen slow adoption of those programs um, because you're not able to double dip with the affordability side of those uh GSE programs. And so uh, CPC has been looking at ways to create products or promote products uh, that give advantage to buildings that are completing energy efficiency scopes of work. Um, the other part of this is that we really focused on the lender and didn't bring a lot of the other players in the multifamily ecosystem into this uh, underwriting practice. So there were limited uh, comps, which is just the comparables for operational data that we would use to underwrite to support more aggressive underwriting and have that accepted by our insurers and appraisers and other uh, multifamily uh, industry partners. Um, so that's something that we've been working on uh, as we move forward from this guide. And the third is just the disjointed priorities and goals that we saw. So some of the short-term costs, first costs to adopt energy efficiency versus long-term investments in promoting higher performance standards. Uh, we were seeing a lot of people focusing just on the operational cost savings versus the first cost to install instead of thinking about um, the long-term benefits of higher performance systems for reducing um, carbon emissions or improving indoor air quality or uh, additional resiliency benefits from higher performance design standards. Um, the, and similarly, the first cost to install versus the cost to retrofit later, once a building is affected by um, the, the outcomes of climate change, like we saw with several of the hurricanes recently, it is much more costly to repair the damage caused by these storms or by other weather events than to install measures to make the building more resilient in the first place. Um, and we also saw a little bit of tension between the incentives available to do that and the required capital improvements for buildings. So there wasn't a lot uh, available for building owners to uh, improve flood resiliency or improve indoor air quality or the ability to shelter in place and they're not willing to make those investments unless they are either required to or incentivized through um, some funding source.
And as we move forward with our um, agency partners and working in affordable housing, we saw a competing um, priority between health and safety measures and energy efficiency measures. A lot of the time when there was uh, not a lot of room in the budget to include energy efficiency, uh, we saw it value engineered out in favor of the health and safety measures that the building was required to complete in order to move forward and, and get the subsidy from the city or state. Um, we, we've been pushing energy efficiency and health and safety as one and the same, um, because energy efficiency measures and, uh, resiliency measures do improve the health and safety of the building and the tenants. Uh, and so that has been, um, an argument we've made moving forward from this guide. And then increased instruction, increased construction costs and questions around operations. So we always talk about the incremental cost of adopting new technologies or new design standards. Um, and does the operational uh, savings make up for those first cost investments? That's something that we've tried to explore going forward. Okay, terrific. So, <clears throat> you know, we, we published the first guide in, and I think it was approximately 2016. So, you know, fast forward three years, it's 2019. Um, the first guide was was terrific and, and was widely adopted and used and, and that underwriting efficiency approach was was really quite quite novel and 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 you know made some waves, which was great. Um, but 2019 comes along, you know, we have this ambitious climate legislation passed at the state level uh, with the CLCPA and the city level in New York City uh, with the Climate Mobilization Act. Um, a new stretch code was in the works and has since been adopted uh, in in New York City and in and, and many other municipalities throughout New York State. Um, you know, Enterprise Green Communities was updating their criteria with new points for low carbon net zero energy design. Uh, NYSERDA was revamping their uh, incentive programs, um, both for new construction and preservation, to uh, align with the state's uh, newly mandated uh, low carbon goals. So we kind of saw this, this lots of things changing um, and kind of just the underwriting to savings for retrofits. Uh, we saw that there really was all of this kind of momentum propelling high performance design to really become the new baseline. And so we realized, of course, that we needed a new guide um, in typical CPC fashion. So, um, you know, we, we also realized, um, you know, obviously the focus was on buildings and multifamily buildings um, at, at, because the energy demand is so great from these type of buildings. Um, for, for example, uh, in New York City, they account for 70% uh, of, the, of the greenhouse gas emissions of the total uh, carbon footprint of the city. So really reducing uh, energy loads and, and then switching those fuel sources to low carbon sources is really a great way to to uh, reduce energy and 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 uh, reduce our carbon footprint simultaneously, um, so we realized from the financing side there were still a lot of unknowns and unknown unknowns, um, and you know it was really up to the financing community to lean in uh, to learn about high performance buildings and how they operate in the real world, uh, and to adapt their practices to meet the needs of the market uh, of the city and state and and of our broader community goals. So we. Uh, published this new guide. Uh, it's designed for multiple stakeholders within the multifamily ecosystem. Uh, so that includes uh, lenders and housing finance agencies, uh, owners and developers of multifamily housing, uh, property managers, uh, appraisers, realtors, and, and so on. Um, it really tackles the basics of high performance design and how those design decisions affect uh, performance, uh, value, uh, risk, and then overall asset health throughout the building's life cycle. Uh, so the, the guide is laid out in chapters that align with the multifamily building life cycle. Um, and so I encourage you to, to, to dig in. Um, it's available online. We'll, we'll share that link later. We also do have hard copies. Um, so feel free to reach out to, to me or Danielle after uh, if you'd like a hard copy of the guide as well. And just really quickly, this is an example of what uh, we're talking about when we say high performance building. Um, we take a lot of the principles laid out in the passive house design standard, um, whether that be PHI or FIAS, which is um, continuous uh, insulation and uh, continuous air barrier and vapor barrier, um, minimal thermal bridging throughout the building uh, and high performance all electric systems. Uh, which here we're, we're using the example of an air source uh, heat pump with many split units on the inside. Um, so this is just 
one of the approaches to high performance building where you've got a really tight, well insulated building with high efficiency heating and cooling, and then additionally, uh, heat or energy recovery ventilation, uh, which brings fresh air into the building, but doesn't waste all of the energy you use conditioning the air inside by bringing either cold or hot air in without partially conditioning it. And you can see that on the right side of the, the figure here. So this is one approach, um, but it is the example we wanted to use because the Passive House Design Standard is, has been um, widely lauded as one of the most efficient design standards uh, and is, is one way to both reduce the, the loads for the building, so the need to heat and cool, uh, while also making the building more resilient so that people could potentially shelter in place if we do have another you know, uh, major weather event. I'm sorry, Italia, I can't say my nose. Is this me or you? This is you. Okay. Um, so with the, uh, the passage of New York City's Climate Mobilization Act, and at the state level, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the CLCPA, um, the transition to a low carbon economy is creating a lot of opportunity for buildings um, to adopt high performance and we're seeing that high performance in this, in this vein is becoming the new baseline. So a lot more codes are moving toward you know, near passive or including passive house uh, um, measures in the code. Um, a lot of the housing agencies are moving their uh, design standards to a more stringent standard. Uh, so we've seen that recently with HCR's uh, design standards for the 4% tax credits, uh, as well as HPD's adoption of Enterprise Green Communities 2020, which includes additional resiliency, uh, stormwater management, and uh, solar mandate. Um, so these are all things that we're seeing in the industry that is pushing uh, these technologies forward. Um, and other US cities and states are adopting their own uh, either energy conservation codes, stretch codes, or uh, low carbon regulation. Um, so whether that be a carbon tax or something like the CMA, which is uh, carbon caps for buildings that, that decreases over time, um, that is a major move in the industry. We're seeing changes in utilities and infrastructure with the advent of the CLCPA and the, the 80 by 40 initiative that was announced years ago by the state. Um, there has been a goal to get our electric grid to clean energy by the year 2040. Um, so we're seeing a lot of changing in that infrastructure and the adoption of rooftop solar for a lot of multifamily buildings to offset some of the, the costs and uh, demand from their buildings on the grid. Uh, and then there are new requirements of capital sources. We're seeing a lot of um, ESG investments and, and other sources demanding that buildings go greener uh, and, and making sure that their investments are both mitigating climate risk uh, and physical risk from climate change, as well as uh, mitigating the risk of uh, regulatory compliance. Um, so just a couple of uh, points here. Um, we're seeing in the industry that, and between the two guides, when we started with retrofits and underwriting energy efficiency, um, and then the, the new guide, which focuses on new construction and high performance, retrofits are much more expensive to bring to a high performance standard. So existing buildings have a lot of existing infrastructure that you need to deal with, potentially systems that haven't run their useful life out. Uh, and so we really need to align the financing opportunities for those buildings in order to get them to a higher standard versus new construction where you can start from scratch and, and really build uh, a tighter, more resilient, uh, more comfortable building. Um, the timelines for compliance with the local laws and the CLCPA uh, are approaching. We're in the year 2021 and the first compliance period for the Climate Mobilization Act in New York City is 2024. And we'll see about 20% of buildings having to change their internal operations to reduce carbon and come under those penalty, ca penalty caps. Um, so there are real financial penalties for buildings that aren't moving forward and aren't building to high performance standards. Um, 
We're seeing increased resources for reducing the reliance on fossil fuels. Uh, the cost of rooftop solar has come down about, what is it, 90% in the last 10 years, Italia. And so the, the ability to access a lot of these technologies has greatly increased. The cost to operate them is much lower. Uh, and these technologies are proven. We're seeing a lot more buildings installing heat pumps with, with no worries about long-term operations. Uh, and then we keep drilling this down, but resiliency is huge. Um, we can't just think about the, the cost savings or the prestige we get from doing uh, energy efficiency and, and building to high performance standards. We do have to think about how the building will survive in the long term and how it how it can withstand some of the major weather events we've been seeing, whether that's um, poor outdoor air quality and pollution or uh, major storms. Great. So, you know, uh, high performance housing serves the multifamily ecosystem's best interest. Um, so we've highlighted, obviously, some of the operational benefits, um, you know, compliance with local laws, uh, resiliency. Um, but there but there are a multitude of, of these kind of non tangible benefits or benefits or non energy benefits. Um, you know, it's estimated that Americans spend 90 percent of their time indoors. Um, obviously, in the past 18 months, it's been closer to 100 percent. So it's very important that we understand how a building can affect uh, the health of its occupants. Um, high performance buildings employ a number of design practices that collectively uh, improve indoor air quality and then you know, as, as a result, the overall health of tenants. Um, this research is, is somewhat new and so we're still kind of learning a lot about this, but um, you know, we're looking at the reduced health costs, for example, um, from living in a high performance building versus you know, kind of a conventional uh, built building. Um, Reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Obviously, with local laws being adopted, you know, nationwide. Um, here in New York, uh, we have a, a prime example um, with Local Law 97. Um, you know, measuring building system performance in terms of greenhouse gas emissions is really crucial uh, to meeting our carbon reduction goals and combating climate change. Um, and while many buildings employ some level of energy efficiency, high performance buildings, so passive house, net zero energy, uh, go much further. Um, in an airtight construction. Uh, maintains indoor air temperature longer and limits the load of HVAC systems. And that more efficient use of heating and cooling as a result um, leads to a significantly lower greenhouse gas emissions. So much easier to comply with, with, these, with these carbon caps. Um, and then resiliency, Danielle you know, just mentioned this. Um, you know, often uh, long-term resiliency is sacrificed uh, for short-term savings. Um, but as the uh, increase of, of, of and frequency and destruction of, of you know, weather related events, uh, storms, um, you know, those life cycle building costs actually are increasing. So we have to think more about the, the life cycle building uh, value and cost versus kind of short term savings. And then um, just in addition to the main guide, which we kind of walked you through at a high level, um, we have included uh, several supplements, um, one of which is a, uh, a financing cheat sheet. Um, so we understand, obviously, that there are cost constraints. We're a lender. We understand that this is not just, you know, everyone would build to high performance if, if we could. Um, but there are uh, more and more incentive programs and rebate programs through, you know, organizations like NYSERDA or through utility companies or, you know, supplemental green loan programs through lenders like, like CPC and, and other CDFIs. Um, so luckily there are financial incentives out there to help reduce the incremental costs of, of, of achieving high performance. Um, so we've consolidated these, the federal, state, and city um, local uh, incentives into uh, this financing cheat sheet, uh, which you can find in, in the guide. And then also included with the guide are three case studies from CPC finance buildings, uh, one in Buffalo, one in Troy, and one in Brooklyn, um, focusing on high performance building standards and high performance systems. Uh, and we're, we're very excited to have one of our uh, developer partners on, on the call with us today uh, as we focused on two of their buildings to compare uh, the operations, including a geothermal heat pump system. Um, so those case studies are available on the website with the guide, if you're curious. Um, the first focuses on uh, near net zero operations and uh, including passive house measures in the construction, and it's a new construction development in Buffalo. The second is an adaptive reuse building, um, comparing operational uh, costs between two buildings in Troy using geothermal heat pumps. And the third is a passive house development uh, in Brooklyn that employs um, 
uh, hydronic uh, gas heating. And just really quickly, um, this is the link for the guide. Uh, the slides should be made available to you, but we'll we'll drop. Uh, it looks like Joe dropped the the link in the chat there. So if you're curious, click through uh, and read the guide. We're really hoping it'll be a great resource for all of our uh, multifamily ecosystem partners. And then we just want to give a quick thank you to all of the partners who helped us develop the guide, uh, brainstorm around the guide, and. Uh, review it uh, to make sure that it was serving uh, all of our partners the best way possible. Um, so thank you to everybody listed, including our uh, designer, Todd Design, for, for helping us pull everything together. Hey, Joe, back to you. All right. Thank you both. Uh, incredibly robust information. Uh, the uh, In the uh, chat, you'll see you'll see a couple of other uh, pieces of information. Um, and so speaking of, uh, of developers, I'd like to now have Bill Walter of Wilder Walter and Griffin Associates join us. And Bill's gonna walk us through uh, a whole lot of good things that your company is doing. Bill, over to you, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks Joe. Uh, so Wilder Walter Partners has uh, been around a long time. We've been in business about 30 years. Uh, we do all sorts of uh, types of residential development throughout the Hudson Valley and elsewhere. Uh, in 2008, after going to Green Build in uh, Colorado, we really embraced what we were calling green construction and that now high performance construction in a lot of developments. So I'm going to go through a quick PowerPoint, but before I do, I wanted to uh, just explain why we're sort of, we sort of have embraced high performance construction. So in 2008, what really became clear to us is that what we're calling high performance construction today, tomorrow will be the, what the building code requires. It just seemed so obvious at the time. So we really wanted to sort of stay ahead of the, the curve and give us an edge as a company by sort of going where eventually everyone's going to have to go. Uh, at the time, we were doing a lot of for sale housing as well, and we thought it would give us an advantage there. And then with funding sources uh, on the affordable housing side, we thought it was the future, so we wanted to really embrace it. High performance construction for us, you know, we're long-term holders, so it gets us better buildings, gets us happier tenants, and ultimately uh, it's something that makes us sort of feel better every day with what we do. We wanted to reduce the carbon footprint of all of the developments we're doing. And I think the last piece, which has become more and more important, is that uh, as Joe had said in the beginning, Affordable housing tends to be a leader in what happens, but when we go to do our projects and you know, all over the place, uh, we fight a lot of nimbyism. By doing better buildings, uh, high performance construction, a lot of really kind of cool stuff that is notable and gets press, it helps us to battle the nimbyism a bit. And we're now seeing that communities are actually reaching out to us to develop in their communities, which is a real advantage given the, the nimby nature of what we do. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, our YMCA develop, redevelopment in Tarrytown. Um, this is a development that uh, was a failed YMCA in Tarrytown that had been around for a long time. And working with a lot of local stakeholders, we came up with a plan to redevelop the property that has us preserving the original historic building um, and building a new building in the back. It's affordable at between 30 and 70% of AMI. It's 80% uh, is restricted, restricted to uh, 55 and over residents. And we did that because we are rehousing all of the men who live in the SRO in the front of the building. And some of them were not 55. So that was a good way to balance it. And being that we're in the downtown of uh, Tarrytown, we're also providing a municipal parking lot uh, that we're essentially giving to the village as a part of the project. Uh, the development's being built to lead gold standards. We may actually get to lead platinum, but at least lead gold. So these are the high performance uh, features of the building that I'll get into some of them you know, in a couple of minutes. Essentially, it's a very well located building in many ways. It's a couple of blocks from the train station. Uh, it's very public, so it gets a lot of attention, which I think is great for the high performance movement to, for people to see that you can do this. Uh, we're, you know, the first green element is we're not knocking down the original four story building, uh, which would have been a lot easier, but it's really for many reasons, the right thing to do is to restore the original building. 
in the back of the property, uh, we are knocking down the one story building that uh, you're gonna see in a future slide and doing a geothermal system. We have a green roof courtyard for all of the residents that helps with stormwater uh, retention, a uh, detention rather. We're doing a large solar array that's gonna produce a lot of the electricity for the building. Uh, as was talked about earlier, you know, we're doing sort of standard things, energy recovery ventilators that were not standard at all, but they're becoming standard for the reasons that uh, I think uh, was mentioned by Italia. Hey uh, Bill, yes? can you um, share your screen? Your slides aren't coming through. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, that would help. One sec. Okay, let's try again. Okay, can you see that? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I'll just quickly. So this is our company. These are the developments we've done in the Hudson Valley. This is our tear down development that I was starting to talk about. These are our high performance measures that we're incorporating in our building. This building is under construction. We started about three months ago uh, building the building uh, and will be done in about two years. We are taking the building, the original building built in 1911 and uh, the two-story addition built in 1915 and doing an adaptive reuse to take that part of the building that was an SRO and a daycare center and building apartments there. The one-story portions in the back are being demolished. So in the, what you're seeing on the left is the new portion of the building. Um, on the right is our bore field. We're doing a geothermal system that's underneath the new portion of the building. So the first thing we're doing, this is gonna be 46 wells. It's a closed loop system, and it's a very efficient system that will allow us to, uh, to use the geothermal for heating, cooling, and hot water. The impetus for this, to do this as geothermal began with the fact that we're in the Con Ed moratorium area. And while we had an existing gas load, it wasn't enough to do all of our um, HVAC. When we really got into it, it made a lot of sense to do this as a geothermal building in the way that we're doing it for every for heating, cooling, and hot water. But as was talked about earlier, selling that to our funding partners was an exercise. And we basically had to show them the returns, um, but ultimately we were successful. And it worked in a way where we're able to finance the entire in incremental cost of the geothermal. We also have a green roof courtyard, which helps us with stormwater, stormwater detention and creates a rec recreational amenity for all of our residents. Our, uh, geo, our system is, our building is all electric. And the effect of that is having a rooftop solar array allows us to take about 40% of all of our electric use for the building and pay for it, or not pay for it, but reduce it by having the solar, solar array. The solar system on the building is roughly about $450,000 in total gross cost. But after the incentives and tax credits, it's a development that actually we have generated more uh, mortgage proceeds to pay for it than the cost of the system, which ultimately makes it a positive de development, not only from a green standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint. As was said previously, that's something that just wasn't true 10 years ago. As I said uh, in the beginning of this, we have a lot of other things that are not currently standard, but are becoming standard. Everything on this list we think will be in the building code in the coming years. 
um, it's really a great feature of this is to be able to say to communities, we're building better buildings than you currently have. And it really does help us to have, to create uh, a desire for what we're doing and others are doing like us. So I'm happy to hear any questions. I did the presentation is a little bit short because I wanted to leave some time because we're going to run out of time. So I want to leave some time for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, what we're going to do is we don't have any questions posed now. So I just want to remind everybody to please use the Q&A box to, to pose your questions. And we're going to actually switch over to, to Susan McCann now from the Community Builders. And she's going to present um, some of their developments that they've used in high performance methods and geothermal heating and, and passive house uh, projects. So um, Susan, take it away and then we'll get to the Q&A after your uh, presentation. Thanks. Hello. Um, can you see my, uh, my slides? We can, thanks. So. Perfect. Great. Um, TCB is a uh, large uh, nonprofit. We're active in 15 states, um, including New York. And uh, today I wanted to focus on the work we've been doing over the last 10 years in the green energy space. TCB's mission, we're a nonprofit, is to build and sustain strong communities where all people can thrive. And increasingly, we absolutely believe that that includes building carbon neutral buildings and building for resilience in a world that is, the climate is changing because we believe as an equity issue, people with less resources will suffer the most as our communities suffer for clim from climate change. Um, when we talk about uh, uh, green energy, we're talking about the environmental benefits, the economic benefits, and the social benefits. I won't go through and read each bullet point, but we really believe conservation is as important as cool new technology. And so we try and keep that in mind in both of our development and property management parts of a building's life cycle. Um, We've worked um, with a lot of different um, branding um, and testing uh, methodologies over the years. We work with NYSERDA. We our buildings, um, almost, I think all of them at this point, reach en um, Energy Star and Energy Green Communities certification. Um, and many of our, not, not many, but increasingly, um, uh, uh, over the years, we've done several uh, lead buildings as well. Uh, as uh, our friends at CPC said, we've done a lot of business with them over the years, um, including this first building, Monument Square, which we did, it was financed almost 10 years ago now, uh, but it, it was uh, uh, our first geothermal um, property. This is a picture of the building. It was a hot historic hotel. Uh, like one of Bill's buildings, it was a lot of very, very, small studio apartments was for elderly and disabled people. It did not have any uh, air conditioning at the time and it had old baseboard electric heat that was not energy efficient. Uh, when we looked at it and we purchased this from another owner, we wanted to be able to get these residents air conditioning, but we didn't wanna have to tear up all the walls in the building because we also had um, lead, asbestos, and other um, contaminants in the building that we needed to not expose. Um, so as we did, as we looked at various um, kinds of HVAC systems, we turned to geothermal. There's a very small resident park next to the building, um, but we luckily found out that that was going to be enough to do a large enough geothermal well field to be able to build um, uh, uh, an efficient um, HVAC system uh, for this building. So at this point, we have 89 units of affordable housing that addresses critical building needs, including the environmental issues and the energy improvements. And we've been able to um, give our residents air conditioning, which was a major goal 
um, for a similar, whereas doing an older kind of system, we just wouldn't have been able to afford that. Um, and, and also keep to our building scope vis-a-vis -vis how many walls we were tearing up. Uh, Tapestry on the Hudson, also in Troy, New York, um, where we've enjoyed working over the last uh, 10 years, is uh, another development where we adopted geothermal heating. However, we went even further on this one. Um, we got a uh, 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 funding from the Environmental Facilities Fund uh, for uh, a few other features like a green roof. Um, we did a terrace. This building is right on the Hudson River in Troy. And so uh, unfortunately the seawall in Troy um, after floods um, 10, 15 years ago, um, are very old and over time need to be replaced. Uh, so we ended up being in the business, which we've never been in before, of replacing a segment of the seawall in Troy. Uh, and doing that actually provided an opportunity to also build a terrace and have parking under the terrace and the geothermal field under the terrace and do some cool things like rainwater collection on top of the, the terrace. So show you a little bit. This is a, one of the buildings we're very proud of. We won, won a lot of awards for this because it's both historically um, a wonderful building and it is uh, a very green building. This is the back part. I mentioned the terrace on the river here. You can see the new seawall we built. There's a parking lot below that is also a geothermal well filled, and then a terrace above where we do gardening, where we have a rainwater collection, and where we have a park playground for our residents. Um, the other part of the geothermal well field is in here and under the surface parking. I do want to say that one challenge on this one was that, uh, uh, and you have to watch out for these things as you go through these buildings, is one of the utility companies, while they were putting um, uh, their box in, ended up puncturing one of our wells. And we had to um, go back and forth with them and restore that well, which did delay the project a little bit. Um, they ended up being, it ended up being a tight well field. And so there, there are things that happen along the way as people get used to the, using this technology. And there are some risks, both in construction and in property management and the operational phase that you do have to watch out for. Uh, our next development where we uh, similarly use geothermal was in a building in Schenectady, New York. And this is, on this, for this one, it's fairly recent. So I was able to pull out some of the in-construction pictures, which you can see are not pretty, but you can see they are starting to build the well field. It's part of a larger development where we're really um, doing a major, major redevelopment with very many different types of housing in a large, in a neighborhood next to downtown Schenectady. We have Energy Star appliances throughout, we have community spaces. We uh, are doing a complete um, uh, redevelopment and we are keeping it green as we are doing it. Some of what we're doing in the neighborhood is rehab, which in some ways is the most um, energy efficient of all work because it's conservation. So we do feel that conservation is a part of green energy. Um, this is the front of the building um, that I showed you before, the mid-rise portion of this redevelopment. And this is the well field and some of the mechanicals um, of the geothermal energy coming into the building. Finally, and I know I'm racing through this a little bit, but we do want to leave time for questions. I'm going to go downstate and focus on a park haven, our most um, recent development to be completed, which is in the Bronx. This one, we really focused, instead of using a geothermal heat system, we decided to really focus on electrification and um, doing some a building that was very, very tight and started moving toward doing a passive house uh, kind of uh, uh, design. This building used funding not only from the city of New York, but we also got a New York State um, Building of Excellence Award from NYSERDA, which really helped us do some of the upgrades 
to the uh, uh, passive house standards. It has green green roofs. It has uh, ERV and, uh, uh, and VRF as the heat pumps as the main uh, uh, HVAC system. And it's a very comfortable building to be in. Um, you can see so that it's a mixed income development from 30 to 80% of median income. It has a supportive housing um, tranche of units. It has many resident amenities. Um, and this is the building, the, uh, you can see solar array on the roof as well as the air handling um, devices and a picture of what one of these units looks like with a VRF um, uh, uh, installation. So I think uh, that winds up my presentation. Uh, be happy to answer questions along with the rest of the panelists. Okay. Everybody's back in the room. Terrific. Thanks, Sue. That was wonderful. Fascinating information. And I'm, and I'm sure um, all four of our speakers could go on for, for hours on any of these topics and any of these developments. We do have a few, um, we have a few questions posed um, in the Q&A and I'm gonna to try to get through them. Um, and I think this question is, is for both Bill and Sue. Uh, rental price points, so I think specifically to Bill in the Tarrytown project, um, where, where are you, what, you know, what um, uh, area median income are you serving? And then, the, and then the second question, I think to both of you, what are the total costs involved in some of these projects? So Bill, maybe we could start with you on the rental price points for, for Tarrytown. Yeah, uh, Tarrytown, uh, our maximum, so we go from 30 to 70% of AMI, um, but to rehouse the men who live there, many of whom who cannot afford 30% of AMI, we actually have a, a, a rent subsidy uh, fund to further subsidize the units. Mm -hmm. um, our total development costs are about $53 million. Um, and the, the high performance uh, construction features in total added about $2 million to the building. Uh, but many of those costs, the majority of those costs uh, came back through uh, the incentive programs and tax credits and the increased costs, the increased NOI supported a higher mortgage so that there was no net cost to the development. So effectively we got a better building yeah. without costing the development money. And it's a more sustainable building. That's something that I think everyone's happier with and will hopefully create an awareness that this is how everyone should be building. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And, and Sue, your, your projects, and you went through a couple of them. So pick, pick one. <laughs> uh, well, it, the, the same is true for all, two of the three um, are, the incomes go from 30 to 80% of area median income. The lower income folks tend to be subsidized with some kind of rental subsidy, Section 8 mm -hmm. or otherwise. The Monument Square development, as I said, is uh, for disabled and elderly. So that is 100% lower income, uh, all Section 8 development that was originally financed back in the 1980s as an old form Section 8 uh, development. Like Bill, my experience is that what we end up doing on these um, developments is raising extra resources to pay for the upfront costs, um, including the higher mortgage, because mm -hmm. we're trying to get lenders to underwrite to what um, by having uh, green building partners who can certify to the fact that our utility costs are not gonna be as high so that we have a slightly larger first mortgage as well as tax credits and other incentives to help us pay for the developments. And these development costs of these buildings range pretty widely. We did Monument Square 10 years ago, but I think the total cost of that, don't quote me, but I think it was around 18 million. And of course the large de development in the Bronx, uh, I think that's 53 million. So there's a wide range of total project costs there. Building costs are getting more expensive, especially during the pandemic. Um, I think um, I remember that the cost for the Park Haven building in the Bronx, the most recent one, it was about $300 per square foot. Yeah, in upstate, I think we're seeing somewhere around 225, 250-ish on, on a square foot basis. 
Um, much, much cheaper upstate than, uh, not much cheaper, but cheaper upstate <laughs> than downstate. Less, less expensive. <laughs> yes. Um, so lo looking at some of the projects, um, and one of, one of the questions is really, it's about occupied buildings and doing retro, retrofits. How, how does a developer um, checkerboard clients or do, you know, handle relocation issues when you're doing major renovations on some of these buildings? Either Sue or Bill. Sue? I'll start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on this Monument Square development, we emptied out two or three floors at the time and did it by floor. So we did, I think we had three or four phases in that seven story building, three phases, I think, in the seven story building. And we were lucky that there was a building next door, right next door, that we were able to move our residents to in a phased way. And that worked for that development. We're working on a former YMCA ourselves, Bill, um, in Jersey City um, and right now. And in that one, we have residents that just aren't stable enough that we were worried about. So we're actually in that one doing tenant in place rehab on the upper floors where we have some of our less stable residents. And our, uh, so the first through the, no, the ground floor through the third floor on that one, we're, we are able to move residents out and back in, but sure. the upper floor is fourth through seventh in that one, we're doing tenant in place rehab. So we have a smaller scope of work upstairs where we're not, where we're not doing as uh, much interior work in the apartments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so on the high performance uh, retrofitting, high performance construction retrofitting, a lot of it is actually easier than the replacing of kitchens and bathrooms that mm -hmm. sort of doesn't relate that much to specifically to high performance. For example, in a building we're doing now, we're gonna be um, creating a new uh, exterior on the building, essentially on the outside of the building without having to disturb the tenants. And it's like going to create a much tighter building, much more efficient building, less expensive to operate building, really a better building in a lot of ways with a lower carbon footprint. Uh, similarly, I think on the interior, the systems, the mechanical systems on the inside, what you're doing at the central locations isn't disruptive to the residents. What you're doing inside of their uh, apartments really is, I don't think, any more or even less work inside of the apartments because mm -hmm. it's high performance construction. So I think it's, it, doesn't, it does lend itself incrementally to doing high performance construction. Thank you both. Um, and this question, I think, should, should go to um, Italian and Danielle. So we've got um, a, a question posed. I'm working on developing my first unit, a straw bale net zero starter home. Very interesting. My goal is to make it affordable to someone earning $15 an hour. Are small experimental developments eligible for these incentives discussed? The incentives vary between single family and multifamily housing. And honestly, we're better versed in the multifamily incentives. And that's what we list in the um, incentives uh, one pager that we include with the guide. But there are some tax credit incentives for solar available for uh, single family housing. There are some nice CERTA single family development uh, incentives, including um, lower cost loan products through NYSERDA. So I would go to NYSERDA's website and explore some of the single family uh, incentives that they have available if that's something you wanna pursue. Sure, and I would, I would add that uh, sometimes homes in community renewal have uh, dollars available through the home program, through community development block pro uh, programs. Um, and, and it's either at the state level or sometimes you find that at the county level in your local community development office or at the city level, if there's a CD office there. Um, so our, our last question, I was, I was saving this question to last because I, I, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, and I'm just sort of going to read, read through it. Uh, a variety of material and style of architecture in the Hudson Valley downtowns is what gives it the distinctiveness that we associate with the charm functionality of our region. As, as, our, as, our, uh, as our guest types this, uh, making everybody aware, and I, and I saw this in action, the Hallmark Channel is filming, was filming in downtown Goshen, attracted here by the historic architecture 
150 to 200 year old buildings and, and neighborhoods. Um, while our, our 30 to 50 year old strip malls just rot away and pose environmental threats happening all over the place. How can we combat these sameness, the sameness of the five over one buildings that seem to be the only thing contemporary developers are proposing? And just a little pushback, I think we saw some really great adaptive reuse uh, examples on, on the presentations this morning. So does anybody want to jump in on, on that? The, you know, historic preservation versus, you know, some of this, this, this newfangled development coming into town. I'll just tell you on our, in our own experience, what we have gone to doing when we present to local municipalities is we often hire truly like a world-class architect to come in as a facade consultant. And we do a lot of consensus building with local people. Tarrytown's a very good example. It's a, it's a place where, they have films being films and commercials and TV shows being filmed all the time because of their historic downtown. So in the case of that specific development, we brought in Byer Blinder Bell, who is a you know, world-renowned architecture firm, not as our main architect, but really on the facade side. And we work with local stakeholders uh, and the architectural uh, review board to take uh, to marry our historic preservation on Main Street with our new building so that we would not have that sameness, that we would have a building that was both historic preservation, but also a building that was sustainable for the future. And I think it worked well. And I think it brings, by embracing it rather than fighting it, I, th I think you make it a win-win. Very good. Sue, anything to add to that? No, it, I think Bill pretty much said it. I think that historic preservation is a great way to get to sustainability. Um, when, and you can do it, and we both have done it, and we do new, both of the two developers on the, this panel do new construction and rehab, and mm -hmm. we like to do both, and we like to make sure that our new construction buildings fit in the context of their communities. Sure, absolutely. Fitting, fitting within the fabric of the community, um, you know, that, that's another way of fighting uh, NIMBYism, because everybody's afraid of the big, giant building coming into the, into the downtown. Um, however, there's, there's also an economy of scale that must be recognized when you're doing this development. And without the economy of, this, of scale, then essentially your pricing is going to be higher and that's not going to be affordable to, to everybody in, in the community. Uh, there was one more question and then I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, what are you seeing for historic preservation retrofits and it's a, a cost per square foot in these downtowns? to put you both on the spot, <laughs> I think that's a tough one. To me, that's too broad a question. I mean, yeah. I will say that if it costs significantly more than tearing it down and rebuilding it, that's a problem with funding sources. Yeah. But what has happened is construction costs have gone up enough in the past 20 years that historic renovation uh, often isn't more expensive to do. Where, where it gets more expensive is that you end up having bigger units, typically often, I shouldn't say always, but often you end up having bigger units when your income is fixed on, regardless of the size of the unit, a one bedroom at you know, 500 square feet versus a one bedroom at 950 square feet, you're gonna get the same income. Right. And you know, we did the Reader's Digest building in Chappaqua, for example, um, and the windows are where they are, and then it ends up getting you bigger units. But I think it can work. I think it takes a, you know, a lot of creativity, but I do think for the most part, it can work. Sure. Thanks, Bill. Sue, anything to add to that? Or, the, or only thing I, the only thing I would add to that is that if you're going through the historic tax credit um, certification process, sometimes you do things that make it the building, you're, you're inheriting a building that, some, that somebody designed sometimes for the sure. different purpose a hundred years ago. So you may end up with some inefficiencies like very wide hallways that makes the building really feel great, but it does make, it does bring up costs because in order to get the same number of units, as Bill said, the, the spacing is not always ideal. Sure. Danielle, any, any closing remarks before we, we close out? I would just say that um, we've seen a lot of uh, both adaptive reuse and retrofit and then new construction high performance uh, coming in at costs similar to projects that aren't incorporating these high performance systems or measures. And so I would really consider early if you are moving toward multifamily uh, 
new construction or retrofit that you fold in these measures as early as possible with your designer, because that's where we see the most cost savings is if you start from here and then uh, move forward. Um, and we'd like to see a lot more uh, low carbon materials and, and low carbon design like, like the developers on this call are pursuing. Very good, very good. Well, thank you all again. Um, and a big thank you to, um, to CPC for partnering with us on this, on this three-part series. It's been, it's been very interesting and very fun. Um, and I put in the chat bar a series of uh, you know, pieces of information and links I would encourage you to take a look at those links for CPC and, and both developers' websites. And um, here in the Hudson Valley, I mean, take, take a short drive, spend, spend a day, go around, see these developments, talk to the tenants. These are wonderful places to live and the communities are lucky to have these developments uh, going on uh, for, for their residents and for their businesses for that matter. Um, so thank you all once again. Our annual housing forum, a housing crisis, finding a place to call home, Again, will be October 26, 27, and 28. Please go to our website to register. Um, and a special thank you to all of the investors in our Center for Housing Solutions, Howard Hanna Rand Realty, the Carney Group, Community Preservation Corp, uh, Rupco, Hudson River Housing, Leviticus Fund, TD Bank, Kirchhoff Companies, and Baxter Development, and of course, our year-long sponsor of these uh, webinars, NeighborWorks America. Thank you all. Have a wonderful